Dark Cast Network, Indie Pods with a Dark Side. Hello and welcome back to Fuck That. Two quick things before I get into this week's episode. Number one, if you don't follow the pod on Facebook, you should. It's at F That Pod. There is a new discussion group. You can request to join. I'm involved in it as well as other people that follow the page. But most importantly, there are a lot of people that I've worked with in previous cases that are going to be active in discussions regarding their cases as well as other cases. So if that's something you're interested in, definitely check it out. Secondly, this is something that I've been really shitty about, but I am now becoming more active with is Patreon. It is at, you guessed it, F that pod. I'm going to have all of the archived episodes on there as well as ad-free episodes, case requests, general discussions, as well as some extras. In the last episode, I covered the Long Island serial killings from the very start in the early 90s, all the way up to the recent events regarding the dirtbag that was arrested on Thursday, July 13th of 2023. I thought that that episode would be a good segue into this case, which is called the Eastbound Four. Actually, there's many names. The Eastbound Strangler case, the Black Horse Pike murders, take a pick, many different weird monikers. But the reason why I thought that that would be a good segue into this case is for a couple of different reasons. Number one, with the recent events that happened with the Gilgo Four and the arrest of Rex Hewerman, a lot of people started chattering again about the possibility that these two cases are connected, which they aren't, by the way. But more importantly, I think what's important is the parallels between the two regarding the women involved. This case is another story about women that were in sex work or had struggles with substance use that were overlooked or judged by society and or authorities at certain points in the case. And I am hoping that because the recent events with the Long Island serial murders case, shedding light again on this case, potentially we can see some movement and make some progress. Sex workers in the United States often operate on the fringes of legality because sex work is not legal in this country. And when I say sex work, that is obviously a much more all-encompassing term now, especially with the emergence of popular sites like OnlyFans. So in this episode, the sex work I am referring to encompasses the sex work that I discussed in the last episode, which involves both in-calls and out-calls, as well as John's. And a John is just the name that is given to the individual that is contacting the sex worker to engage in whatever they both agree upon. In calls are obviously when the John calls the person that's working and meets the person wherever they are. Out calls is the opposite. The sex worker will travel to wherever the John is. And obviously, there are dangers involved in both in calls and out calls. However, there is a much greater risk of danger with out calls. So, circling back to sex workers often being forced to operate on the fringes of legality due to the nature of their work, this puts them at an increased risk of violence. Tragically, these violent incidences, regardless of whether they are an assault, a sexual assault or a homicide go either unnoticed or unreported. And this perpetuates a cycle of silence and suffering that these individuals go through. But in spite of the alarming prevalence of violence directed towards sex workers, their struggles still remain to this day largely ignored or dismissed, relegated to the margins of public discourse. 
According to a research paper published in 2011, which I linked in the show notes, this paper aimed to quantify homicide data among sex workers between 1970 to 2009. And while the number of serial murder cases declined during this period, the likelihood that the victim was a woman increased. Additionally, the likelihood that the victim was a sex worker increased as well. The study demonstrated that 32% of serial murder cases between 1970 to 2009 in the United States, the victims were female sex workers. While it is hard to quantify exactly the percentage of the population that sex workers comprise due to the fact that research is just limited, there are a few different studies that suggest that sex workers probably total between 1 to 2% of the population in the United States, and this is a generous number, so it's likely less. Considering the fact that this is such a small portion of the United States population that makes up this demographic, the fact that 32% of serial murder cases involving this population obviously suggests that female sex workers are typically the target for serial murderers in the United States. Now, keep in mind, this data does not include any homicides that fall outside of the parameters of belonging to a serial murder case. So this doesn't include any other homicide. This data also does not include other acts of violence that are perpetuated against female sex workers, like sexual assault, assault, sex trafficking. And obviously, it's not just female sex workers that this violence isn't unique to. This applies to sex workers as a whole. But just for the sake of this case, I want to focus on this data specifically. And again, I wanted to share this data because the last episode I covered the Long Island serial killings. And the overarching theme amongst both is that the majority of the victims were sex workers. And for these marginalized individuals, Violence becomes something that is all too common, and the stigma that they endure from society only further exacerbates their vulnerability. Located approximately 14 miles west of the heart of Atlantic City, New Jersey, lies Egg Harbor Township. Positioned between the Atlantic City Expressway and the Black Horse Pike, there exists a deserted service road lined by a series of motels that features a drainage ditch that feeds into Lakes Bay. On Monday, November 20th of 2006, Two women were walking along the service road when their attention was drawn to something peculiar, jutting from the brush on the embankment at the road's side. Intrigued, the women cautiously approached, but they soon realized that it was a pair of bare feet. What started as curiosity quickly turned to horror as these two women discovered the lifeless body of a woman sloped down the embankment. The women were obviously fucked up by what they just discovered, and they immediately called 911. The woman who called stated, quote, Me and my friend were taking a walk on the path by the railroad tracks. There's a dead woman down there. And very quickly, this somber scene became a crime scene, and the investigation into the mysterious circumstances surrounding the woman's death was quickly set into motion. However, What investigators did not know was that the discovery of the first woman would lead to three more. Fairly quickly into the investigation, investigators were able to determine that one of the victims died of strangulation and another of asphyxia, but unfortunately, the other two women were found in an advanced state of decomp, which left the causes of their death unfortunately shrouded in mystery to this day. But investigators do believe that likely all four women died due to strangulation, asphyxiation. All four of these women were abandoned along that service road, sloping down the embankment, and they were positioned with their heads all facing east towards the water and towards the center of Atlantic City. 
Additionally, all four women were barefoot, without any socks, and without any personal belongings on their person. What's important to note about the location where they were discovered is that these discoveries were made in an obscure and unfamiliar location to most. This area was only considered something that was familiar to locals, and this desolate spot really lied tucked away from every other part of Atlantic City. It really was like on the outskirts and wasn't something that people knew about unless they patrolled and were familiar with the area. Because the location was somewhat desolate and wasn't really frequented by anybody that wasn't a regular, if that at all, this allowed there to be a large gap of time between the first murder and the last murder. Kim Raffo, the first woman to be discovered, was left closest to the service road, away from the brush and the drainage area, almost directly behind the back door into the Golden Key Motel, which led authorities to consider the fact that perhaps the person that was responsible for these crimes wanted Kim to be found. Walking along the service road, it would have been obvious to the person that perpetrated the crime, unless they were a complete fucking idiot, that her body would have been discovered, so that led authorities to believe that it was intentional. Additionally, because the area was so desolate and just unfamiliar to anybody outside of the area, Authorities also suspected that the killer was likely somebody that was a local and very familiar with the area. Kim Raffo was born in Brooklyn, New York, where she met her future husband, Hugh, in 1989, when they were both teenagers. The two fell in love, they married, and they moved to Florida in the 1990s, eventually having two children. Kim and Hugh led what relatives said appeared to be a very tranquil and happy life. One of Kim's sisters described her as a, quote, mom of the year, end quote. Kim volunteered not only with the PTA, but with the Girl Scouts, and was also referred to as a Martha Stewart type of wife and mother. But in 2003, after Kim grew restless with the routine of her life, which I just want to stress, this is something that I think is very relatable. Get married, you have kids. Not that that isn't fulfilling, but I'm not saying this to belittle her because I think everybody can get kind of bored with repetition and sometimes people need to switch things up. So Kim decided to enroll in a cooking class at a technical school, but it is here that she meets a chef named Kenny Billicky. And this man turns her life upside down and not for the better. I might be saying his name wrong. I'm not going to lie. I didn't really read into it too much because I feel like this man is a little bit problematic and therefore I didn't put effort into it. I hope he's doing well, but I don't give a shit about how his last name is pronounced. So regarding Kim and Kenny's introduction and how they met, there is a lot of conflicting information and I just could not figure out what is fact and what is fiction. So there's really two main ideas as to how this transpired, and I'm just going to give you both. Either Kenny and Kim met during this cooking class, moved to Atlantic City together, she left her husband and children behind wanting to start a new life, and the two, after living there for some time and working, fell into a life of partying that led to using drugs, or when Kim and Kenny met, he got her hooked on drugs which led to her husband leaving with the children, which is understandable. I can't ascertain which one is true, but either way, Kim and Kenny moved to Atlantic City and the two had challenges with substance use. I want to quickly discuss Atlantic City and how it operates before I discuss Kim's life further because the dichotomy between the epicenter of Atlantic City and what remained is at the heart of this case. While Atlantic City is no longer what it was today, I mean, the casino areas just are not as poppin' as they used to be. Back around 2006, this was a huge area, and the city was doing very well. Atlantic City had several well-known casinos like the Tropicana or like Trump's absolutely ridiculous and, quite frankly, tacky Taj Mahal, But life in Atlantic City amongst the casinos looked really grandiose and lively, but 
life outside of the casino walls was very different. The casinos in the city generated a lot of wealth, but it created a vacuum that formed large pockets of poverty and crime around the city and the surrounding areas and outskirts. Pacific Avenue, which is a block inland from the boardwalk, is an area known as the track. And the track is a place where locals go to purchase drugs, use drugs, and where sex workers will often frequent looking for an opportunity for work. When Kim and Kenny moved to Atlantic City, the pair found work at a casino restaurant where Kim waitressed. Kenny eventually lost his job due to his challenges with substance use, and he ended up turning to shoplifting. Kim eventually began working as a sex worker on the track. In September of 2006, two months prior to the discovery of these four women, Kim's former husband traveled to Atlantic City in an attempt to find Kim and hopefully remove her from the city. He told Kim he wanted to take her away from Atlantic City and help her get back on her feet, and Kim ultimately agreed to this. Kim went to Long Island to stay with her ex-husband, where she remained for several weeks while she lived in sobriety. However, Kim made the decision to leave and return to Atlantic City in November. When Kim returned, she stayed with a friend that was a bartender at the restaurant she worked at prior, but she quickly fell back into the life that she had previously left behind. This friend is likely the last person that saw Kim on Sunday, November 19th, the day prior to the discovery of her body. Unconfirmed sources stated that Kim went with a John to the Taj Mahal casino, but left shortly after 5 a.m. to purchase drugs. Kim was found again the next day by the two women who were walking along the service road. Investigators believe she was strangled with a rope or cord, and she was found with cocaine in her system. Kim was 35 years old when she was murdered. But instead of remembering Kim for the decisions that she made, I think that we should remember Kim as a woman who was a mother and was a wife and was known as a supermom who volunteered whenever she could. By all accounts, Kim was a doting wife and a doting mother prior to her involvement with Kenny, and I think we should remember her for that. Barbara Bredor was originally from Pennsylvania, and she was known as a joyful and lighthearted young girl growing up. Barbara, unfortunately, was faced with the challenge of coping with her father's sudden death, and she had a really hard time making sense of this, which eventually caused her to leave Penn State University early. In 1997, Barbara had a daughter, which was something that she always wanted to do. She always wanted to become a mom. But unfortunately, the relationship with her boyfriend was abusive. So for that, among other reasons, she asked relatives in Florida to take care of her daughter for her. Barbara ended up renting a house near Atlantic City, where she managed her family's boardwalk jewelry store. And in addition to that, she worked as a cocktail waitress at the Tropicana Casino. But Barbara's challenges with coping with the difficulties that she faced in life were just too much for her at the time, and she began to self-medicate in an attempt to cope with the challenges that she faced. Barbara's substance use obviously created instability in her life, and she eventually turned to sex work. Barbara disappeared on October 17th, and after her sisters, whom she was still very close with and in open communication with, attempted to report her missing to authorities, they were dismissed by the police due to her prior arrest for sex working charges. Really surprised by that because I've literally never heard of that happening before ever. Because of the authorities' indifference to yet another person who turned to sex work in an effort to make ends meet, her body was not discovered until the discovery of Kim. But at that point, Barbara's body was so badly decomposed that it was unfortunately impossible to determine the cause of death. However, Authorities did reveal that she had a potentially lethal level of heroin in her system. Despite the challenges that Barbara faced, her sisters stated that they will forever cherish the memories of their happy childhood together in the Philadelphia suburbs and the summers that they spent together on the Jersey Shore. 
Barbara, who was 42 at the time of her death, had a life journey that was marked by ups and downs. But Barbara, like Kim, was more than the hardships she faced and the choices that she made. Molly Jean Diltz grew up in Black Lake, a small mining town in Pennsylvania. Tragically, as a teenager, she endured not only the loss of her mother, who was waiting for a heart transplant, but her brother as well, who died by suicide. Molly had a young child for whom she sought care for from relatives. Molly obviously had a very tragic life given the immense amount of loss that she had faced. So she decided to move to Atlantic City to start fresh, and she worked as a fast food cook. Now, some sources say that Molly worked as a sex worker. Many others say that she did not. This has been unconfirmed and still remains a speculation. Personally, I don't think it really matters because her life was taken away and her choice of work doesn't fucking matter. Friends close to Molly did reveal that she struggled emotionally and often expressed thoughts of suicide, which I think, given the circumstances and all the challenges that she faced, is not surprising. In an attempt to cope with what she faced, Molly often turned to drinking. On October 7th, Molly left her residence and later vanished after reaching out to her family. Molly was the first victim among the four women, and unfortunately, the cause of her death remains undetermined due to the advanced state of decomposition. Investigators believe that she was likely left there in a state of decomposition for at least a month. Molly had no traces of drugs in her system, but alcohol was found in her system. Molly was 20 years old at the time of her death. Molly's father, Werner, spoke very highly of her, emphasizing that Molly was a good woman and a devoted mother. One of her uncles said after her death that she was, quote, a warm and loving, caring kid. She had a lot of good to spread to the world, and it's just a shame that she won't be able to do that. Tracy Ann Roberts was raised in Newcastle, Delaware. During her teenage years, she dropped out of high school and briefly pursued a career as a medical assistant. After living in Philadelphia, Tracy began working as a dancer in Atlantic City. After Tracy's struggles with substance use worsened, she began to work as a sex worker. According to multiple sources, Tracy lived in the same group of buildings as Kim and many sources additionally say that the two were friends. Similarly to Kim, there are two different narratives with Tracy as well, so I'm just going to give you both, and unfortunately, I have tried to determine which one was true and which one wasn't, and it's really just a 50-50 divide. Tracy did go missing in November, but one narrative says that she was shopping with a man named Dante, who I suspect might be the man that is in the second narrative, but I have no evidence of this. It's just my hunch. But she was shopping with this man named Dante. She ended up purchasing the outfit that she was wearing when her body was found. She told Dante that she was going to leave and would be back within the hour, but tragically, she never returned. Other sources say that she was last seen alive with a man who wanted to be her pimp. The man attacked her, hitting her in the throat, which led to her being hospitalized. And then after that, she disappeared. Either way, the circumstances surrounding Tracy's death pointed to asphyxiation, and she was found with large amounts of cocaine in her system. Tracy was only 23 when she was murdered. But I wanted to shed some light on this really tragic event. According to several sources, Tracy's daughter is either about to or has recently earned her graduate degree in economics. Early investigations determined that all four women either lived near or worked near the track and potentially may have all known each other somehow. A 41-year-old repairman was the initial focus of the investigation for quite some time. While this man's name is public, his reputation was destroyed due to this, and he was thereafter referred to as the fifth victim in this. 
which I think might be like a little bit dramatic, but I can understand the sentiment behind it. So out of respect for this man's privacy, I'm going to keep his name private because he was never formally charged with anything and had no link to the crimes. You can Google this man's name. I'm going to refer to him as John Doe. So John Doe became a person of interest because he worked as a maintenance worker for the Golden Key Motel, which was again right off of the path where these women were found. And he stayed there for free in exchange for repairs. John Doe initially gained the attention of authorities because he contacted them to let them know, which, side note, not really sure what the authorities were doing. Maybe they were partying hard at the Tropicana. I don't fucking know. Why the fuck would a serial killer call the authorities and say, hey guys, I found this and you may like want to check it out and shit, you know, FYI. It wouldn't fucking happen. It wouldn't happen. So anyway, this man came under fire by authorities because he called them. He called them and said, hey guys, I found a shoe on the roof of this motel that I work at and thought it may be related to the case. And the authorities were therefore like, but we got our fucking guy. Case closed. Fuck him. Now, following an alleged, which hasn't been proven, and this is all kind of just messy, and I re- there's really no solid, concrete information out there, so I apologize. It's really just undetermined to this day. But following an alleged domestic dispute between John Doe and his girlfriend, his girlfriend got pissed and called police to implicate him in these crimes, these murders. Authorities investigated John Doe's room at the Golden Key and his truck. They found no evidence implicating him in the murders, but in the room that he shared with his girlfriend, they found almost like a camera voyeuristic setup with a DVD that allegedly had still photos of his 15-year-old, not officially stepdaughter. What's really fucked up about this, though, for a multitude of reasons, is that he was obviously apprehended based on this DVD, but investigators didn't bother with that. They apprehended him solely to interview him based on these four murders, because that's what they honed in on him for. And when they didn't find any connection between him and the murders, they let him out when he was never charged with anything. So this led many people to say, well, he obviously didn't have anything to do with the DVD. John Doe stated that he had nothing to do with the DVD, that his girlfriend did all of this. His lawyer says that his girlfriend did all of this. His friends, as well as people that like barely even know this man, said his girlfriend did all of this. I don't know what's true or what's not, unfortunately. I wish I had an answer. But ultimately, he was let go, and he was never charged with anything. But I think the real issue here is that authorities really apprehended this man because they had tunnel vision, and they were just sure, oh, they picked up a scent. This has to be the guy. And when they realized he wasn't, they let him go. So nothing came about the DVD, and who knows what opportunities they may have missed while they were focused on this man. John Doe still states that he is innocent to this day, and he still remains free of any charges to this day. According to a book I read, The Eastbound Strangler Behind the Scenes of ID's Dark Minds, which I've included in the show notes, a source came forward to the journalist who co-authored the book. Now, this woman told him that she was with Kim the night of her murder and that the pair were partying with three Johns at a hotel. According to the source, One of the Johns she described as being very sketchy and wired. The man allegedly had a fixation on feet. Remember that all four of the women were found barefoot without any socks or shoes. According to her, the man kept putting his hand around Kim's neck, and the source left later in the evening after feeling uncomfortable when the three men became physical, but in an aggressive way. But immediately when she heard about the discovery of Kim's body, she told police about the encounter. And according to this woman, when she told them about the encounter, they did not take her seriously, and they told her they already had their guy, likely referring to the John Doe that I had just mentioned. Circling back to the top of the episode, I mentioned that in light of the recent events in the Long Island serial murder case, new light has been shed on this case. However, 
many people began to question a link between the two. But on August 1st, Atlantic City Prosecutor's Office announced that there was no connection. And this was done after they collaborated with Suffolk County Police to examine evidence. The investigation into the murders of Kim Raffo, Barbara Brador, Molly Jean Diltz, and Tracy Ann Roberts remains ongoing to this day. It will be 17 years this November. The Golden Key Motel, near where the women were found, was demolished in the summer of 2015. While investigators ultimately determined that there was no connection between the recent Long Island serial murder arrest and these murders, the community remains hopeful that the recent attention brought to this case could lead to new information, or maybe someday, an arrest. The tragic stories of the four women murdered will hopefully compel society to change the narrative surrounding sex workers and substance use. These women's lives deserve justice. Their stories deserve to be heard, and their deaths demand a meaningful action to create a safer and more compassionate world for all. Anyone with information about the unsolved murders should call the Atlantic City's Prosecutor's Office at 609-909-7800, or you can visit acpo.org slash tip slash new to submit an anonymous tip. And I will include this information as well as any other relevant information in the show notes. If you liked what you heard today, please subscribe. Leave me a review across any platform. You can find the podcast on all social media at fthatpod, except for Instagram at fthat underscore pod. Don't forget to check out the website, fthatpod.com, and check out the podcast on Patreon at fthatpod.com.